10 this morning, 774, when a rose called a fountain. Let's all stand. <laughs> Philippians 1 through 11. That'd be Philippians 2, 1 through 11. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out now only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has exalt, highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that is the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, and of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God and the Father. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come to your house and hear your word read. We thank you, Lord, that we are able to come and worship you in spirit and truth in and, and this great nation. Lord, we pray for our nation as we enter the election year this year to coming up in November. Lord, I pray that we put in our minds of Christian people to go out and vote your word. Lord, what you'd have us do, we can get this nation turned back around. Lord, we pray for our, our country, that if we can do things with the, this leading, this, that you'd have us to do, Lord, that we can do things right. Lord, we pray, pray for our, our foreign, our, our military leaders, Lord, and militaries there for home and abroad, Lord, that you'd be with them. Our missionaries on the field, Lord, as they spread your word. We thank you, Lord, that you are a God that loves us and cares for us like you do. We pray for our ones on our prayer list, God, you'd reach down and touch and heal where they're ones that are sick lord ones caring for them continue blessing upon them we thank you lord that you up there some are doing better continue blessing upon them i want to pray for brother bruce this morning as he brings a message lord that you preach that he lay he preach what you lay on his heart lord that draw us all closer to you lord that we'd all have receptive hearts and ears to hear what you'd have to say to us 
Just be with us, Lord. Continue to bless us. Let us always be found doing things pleasing to you. Watch over care for each one of us, Lord, and forgive us we fail thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. How are y'all today? Good. You ever heard the expression, the Lord works in mysterious ways? No. Well, that's an expression. And the Lord definitely worked. <laughs> definitely worked in a mysterious ways for the in a mysterious way for the children's sermon this morning. My daughter Jordan's back there. I'm gonna embarrass her just a little bit. 
I asked her what she thought we ought to do for children's sermon this morning. You know what she said? Uh huh. You ever answer like that before? Uh huh. Uh huh. I said, well, come on. Don't you have one idea? She said, uh, people. I said, people? People. I said, well, what about people? Can you get more specific than that? No, just people. I said, okay. Uh, we'll talk about people. Let's see, what can we talk about people about? Do any of you know people? You know some people, don't you? Yeah. yeah. I know some people. I know some people who really far from us are cousins. You know people who live far from you? Yeah, Atlanta. My cousin in China. My dad called him on his lunch time. You got a cousin in China? That is a cousin, but my dad called him from China. Yeah, uh, uh, somebody called from China. Where you know some? Tell me where you know these people from. Where you know? I know. I know where the A is from. Oh. Because like one year in China, but. Bo and Dallin. You know some people? Um, my cousins from Louisiana. You got cousins from Louisiana. Oh, yeah. I know, I know a big one. I got, I well, know, I got lots of Y'all know lots of people. She, you had your hand up. What's what some people you know? Santa from the North Pole. Santa from the North Pole. <laughs> we know all time. All right, wait a minute. I got another question, though. We got, we got to move forward. Uh, how many of you know people who are a lot like you? Yeah. How many of you know people who's nothing like you? Who don't add anything like you? Who don't think like you? Who don't act like you? Yeah. How many of you know tall people? How many of you know short people? How many of you know athletic people? People who play sports and, and things like that? How many of you know people who like school and really get into reading and, and math and stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah. Listen, we could go on forever about all the different type of people that we know. You know why? Because there's all different types of people. There's people like us. There's people not like us. There's people who think like we think. There's people who don't think like we think. There's people who look like us. There's people who don't look like us. There's people from this country, people from another country, people that we talk to every day, people that we don't talk to very often. There's all kinds of people. But you know something that every person in the world has in common? Well, let me tell you. Well, not everybody knows Jesus. That's a good answer. God loves everybody in the world, right? But not everybody knows Jesus. But let me tell you something that they do have in common. This comes out of Genesis chapter 1. It's verse 27. And this is what it says. It says, God created man in his own image. And he created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. Let me tell you something that every person on the face of the planet has in common. They are created in the image of Jesus. They're created in the image of God. They all, when God looked out across all humanity for all of time, all the people that will ever be born, all the people that you know and all the people that you don't know, he bestowed on them the likeness of himself. Y'all know what that means? That means that you and you and all of you and me and all of them and everybody all across the world and you. All people are created by a loving God who gave them the likeness of himself. That means this, every person, every person, whether we know them, whether we don't know them, whether we agree with them or whether we don't agree with them, they deserve our respect because they are made in the image of our Father. They're made in the image of God. So I want you to think about this next time you think about people that you do know and people that you don't know. And the people that you do know, the ones that are different from you, or the ones that are a lot like you, I want you to remember this. You ready? You ready? God loves them. God loves them. And they're made in his image. And they deserve our respect simply for that. Sometimes it's hard to respect people that you disagree with, isn't it? But remember this. They're people, they have feelings, and they're made in the image of our God. Okay? All right? All right, let's say a prayer and let's thank God for that. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this day. 
God, thank you for the Bible, and thank you that in it you tell us, Lord, where we came from. You tell us that you made us, and you tell us how you made us, Lord, that you made us in your image. God, we don't deserve to be made in your image. And to be honest with you, I don't fully understand what that means. But I know that what you say is that every person on the face of this planet is made in your image, God. And that every person, because of that, deserves our respect and deserves our love and deserves for us to tell them about you. God, we thank you for that. We thank you that you tell us how important we are, Lord. Each individual person on this whole planet, how important they are because we're made in your image. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Your hymns revive us again, 434. Let's all stand. <laughs> God, we come to you this morning and thank you for a new day, uh, opportunity to be here in your house and in your presence. It's a great thing, Father. We thank you for the singing this morning, for the praying. We thank you for the reading of your word. We pray, Father, as we open up and study your word this morning, that you would open our hearts, open our minds, and be with Bruce as he leads us. Just give him the scriptures and and the words that you intend for us to hear today. We pray, Father, for the sick, for those that are suffering on our prayer list. We ask you to grant them the mercy and healing as you see fit. We pray, Father, for the uh, activities we have coming up with this church. We just ask you to uh, have your hand in each of them. Be with us as, as the busy summertime begins. Bless us as we uh, go through each day. Keep us safe in our our travels as we go out into the world father help us to be compassionate to the needs of others and we ask you father to bless these tithes and offerings for your service and send your son jesus's name we pray amen, amen.
purpose, Many Baptist Church is in all activities to glorify God as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, to call saints to worship and sinners to repentance. Charlie and Choir, y'all did great. Amen. That's some good music. Thank you so much for uh, working hard, practicing, preparing, and then praising the Lord for us this morning and leading us to this time of worship. Uh, we enjoyed that tremendously. All right, let's take our Bibles and go to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. going to read the first 17 verses. Sounds like most of you found that, so if you would please, those that can stand in honor of the word of God as I read these verses for us. Now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Simon said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, you are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then be your Lord and teacher, and I have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Thank you. you. May be seated. We've uh, entered now that part of Scripture where Jesus has left the crowds and he has uh, entered and to the teaching of his own. He is no longer in his public ministry. Uh, he is now in the private ministry of his disciples and therefore in the ministry uh, of us. He'll be in that ministry from uh, chapters 13 through 17 uh, that we'll see. Uh, this particular passage that we are going to look at this morning has at least three layers in it that needs to be examined and understood. Uh, this morning, I'll look at the primary layer, that layer that we should look at first and see. And then tonight, I'll go over the other two layers uh, that needs to be examined and looked at. Then if I have time, and I, hopefully I will, because I'm going to just do a cursory look at the other two layers, hopefully tonight, uh, that, uh, that we look at, uh, I will try to answer questions. And uh, then if we have time from that, uh, I want to take a quick answer and look at 
what in the world has happened in our world where we see our college campuses have exploded with this anti-American hysteria where people would scream out, I am Hamas, and death to America, and all the hysterics we see. What is causing that? What is some of the reasons that that is happening? And try to, um, to give an answer to some of that. I think we need to begin to think about that and understand some of what's going on. If you don't um, do that, uh, we're, we're going to be in a world of hurt and trouble if some folks don't begin to understand what's going on. And so I'll try to uh, plow that ground a little bit also. So that's a pretty good bit tonight if I get a chance to do some of that. So I'll try to hit some of those areas tonight uh, as we are able to get through some of that. This morning, though, let's go uh, with that so I can uh, cover this ground that we have to cover. This, this passage here is, was one of those central passages to understand. If you don't get this passage, you're going to have problems um, understanding what, our, what, what, are, what are we to be doing in the age in which we live in. And if you don't uh, have some understanding of the context of it, uh, it's going to give you some problems. So, and I know folks don't like to sit and listen to context, and so I'll try to give it as briefly as I can, uh, but you do need the context uh, so you can understand. So it says, now before the Feast of Passover. So we are now uh, on Thursday evening before the Friday that Jesus is going to be crucified. Uh, most scholars, and I'm not a scholar, but most scholars uh, believe that this is A.D. 30. Um, they believe it's in the month of April, Nisan, and, uh, and so that is when they believe this, this is happening. Um, the the date, the date is not as important as to understand the time, the, the event that is taking place. The Word of God tells us it is before the Feast of Passover. Now, I could just assume everybody in this building and everybody that's listening uh, on our video feeds uh, understand what it means when it says that it was before the Feast of Passover, but that might not be a good assumption by me, so let me write, write briefly, uh, uh, give you a brief understanding of what that means. Passover is an event that took place in the life of the Jewish folks that they celebrated and none of them forgot. It was such a tremendous event in their life. They had been captives in Egypt for over 430 years. And God delivered them by the servant Moses. And most folks, whether they are Bible folks or not, know who Moses is. Now, we may be losing that, but right now, most folks, if you talk about Moses and talk about the parting of the Red Sea, they'll have some cursory knowledge of who that is. Well, before God delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt, he had to persuade the Pharaoh, the king, to let the children of God go. Now, just like that uh, we have Noah in the ark, and our imagery of that is a little bitty ark with giraffes and other animals sticking their heads out of the ark, and we have them uh, going across the flood, we have also a wrong picture of the children of Israel uh, leave, leaving Egypt. We have uh, maybe 100 or 150, if you have that big a picture, of folks marching out of Egypt being delivered there. Well, that's not a good picture. Most likely, God delivered somewhere between two and two and a half million people out of Egypt. So the, the, the whole process of folks that left Egypt that God had to snatch out of the hands of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, was somewhere around two and a half million people along with all their sheep, along with all of their cattle, along with all of their camels, along with everything that came along with that. It was a pretty good-sized group that left. And so it took a pretty good bit of convincing for him to do so. And so God sent nine plagues upon uh, Pharaoh and Egypt to convince them that they should let this treasure go. The nine plagues failed to convince Pharaoh 
to let them go. And so finally, God sent the final plague, and that plague, the tenth, was the death angel. And God sent the death angel to kill the firstborn of every creature in Egypt, from the male human child to the male animal child, every uh, male firstborn child. I am a male firstborn child of my family. That wouldn't have been a good thing in Egypt. I would have expired on that night. And so, um, so every male firstborn child died that night, including Pharaoh's heir apparent, his firstborn child, died. God had told the nation of Israel, the people in Israel, if you don't want your male firstborn child to die, kill a lamb, gave specifics about the lamb, take the blood of that lamb, and with a uh, bush, put that uh, lamb's blood across the top of your door and down your doorpost. And when the death angel comes to your house, he'll pass over it. And sure enough, at twilight in the evening, as the sun was setting, the death angel passed over, and when he saw that blood upon the doorpost and the top of the house, a tent, or wherever they're living, the death angel did not kill the firstborn. And this was a picture of that Jesus would come and he would shed his blood so that folks who were under his blood, they would not be killed, that their sins would be covered. So for uh, centuries and millennia, well, a millennia and almost half, the children of Israel had been celebrating once a year this event, and it was called Passover because the death angel passed over that house. And so that's the reason it became known as Passover. So it was at this time in the spring, as a matter of fact, Last Tuesday, this week past, was Passover for the Jewish race. They are still celebrating Passover to this very day. And last, beginning at sundown on Monday afternoon, because the Jewish folks celebrate days, as the Bible records, from sundown to sundown. And so sundown last Monday afternoon until sundown Tuesday afternoon was Passover for the Jews, and devout Jews across the world celebrated Passover last week. So that's now almost two and a half millennia they have been celebrating Passover. Unfortunately, they missed the Passover of the Lord Jesus. They will one day recognize it. And so, uh, so here the Bible records for us, it was at that uh, Passover feast, uh, at most likely 30 uh, A.D., that the Lord Jesus in an upper room uh, w- was at, and he, they were celebrating that, that Passover, which the events during it all pointed to him coming and dying for the sins of the world. And Jesus said he knew now that all that that pointed to, that his hour had come, that he indeed would be that Passover lamb, that he would shed his blood and that the last lamb that needed to be shed had been shed. There would be no more necessity for lambs to shed their blood because he himself was the Lamb of God. Three years prior, he had come to John the Baptist, who was baptizing on the river, and John the Baptist had said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He knew why he had come, and he had come for that very hour. And he said, he said, I know I know I've come, and I know I'm going to depart out of the world, and I'm going back to the Father. I like that he says, I'm not going back to heaven. I'm going back to the Father. See, heaven denotes a wonderful place. It denotes... Uh, mansions, it denotes streets of gold, it denotes all our loved ones. But the wonderful thing about heaven to Jesus was that his father was there. It makes me sad to hear folks talk about heaven 
in this harsh way of they want to go to heaven because there's a mansion there. They want to go to heaven because there's a street of gold there. They want to go to heaven because some loved one is there. I want to tell you, that's the wrong reason to want to go to heaven. Now, those things are there, and they're going to be good, but that's not what's good about heaven. What's good about heaven is that the Father is there. And because the Father is there, the Son is there, and the Spirit is there. We ought to have our eyes on the right thing. See, that's what will purify this flesh. And that's what will make you walk straight. A street of gold won't make you walk straight. A mansion won't make you walk straight. A loved one won't even make you walk straight. But I want to tell you, a nail-pierced hand will make you walk straight. And so Jesus says, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Man, he looked at those disciples the Bible says he loved them to the end. He loved them to the end of his time on this earth, and he loved them throughout eternity. You got to know what was happening for that to mean something to you. Around this area where they were reclining, we'll see it a little more vividly here in a minute, but I just want to tell you right now so you understand that statement, were his beloved, wonderful disciples. You think of them now. So you know too much to understand this. You see them and their maturity, but they weren't mature right now. And here they were. They were bickering and talking about who was going to be the greatest. So, see, see, they were sitting there with anticipation. They just knew that Jesus was at any moment going to stand up and declare himself to be the King of kings and the Lord of lords and tell them how he was going to, uh, to uh, defeat Rome and set himself up as the king. I mean, anybody that could walk on water, anybody that could raise the dead like Lazarus, anybody that could do what he could do could certainly take care of Rome. And they had read what the Bible said that the Messiah was do, could do, and they were ready. They just knew. I mean, he was telling them, it's hours here. I'm, it, the time has come. And they just knew. Here we are. This is it, boys. And I'm going to get the top spot. And they were bickering about who was going to be in the top spot. And here Jesus was within hours of being crucified. And Jesus says, he looks at them, but I love these boys. Now listen, I know Bruce Gordon. And if I'd have been Jesus, if I'd have been the Lord, I'd have got me some new guys. These wouldn't have been the ones I'd have wanted looking after my world. Hallelujah, I, I'm not the Lord God. These are the ones he had chosen. And verse 2 says, I, you, you can, I could hardly look and read it, verse 2. Can you? He says, supper being ended, the devil, see, the devil was there. The devil had already entered into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son. See how the Holy Spirit, he makes sure you understand who this person is. I don't know if Simon was still alive. I hope he didn't ever have to read this passage to betray him. That ought to shake you to your boots. Here was a man that had walked with the Lord Jesus, had heard him preach, had seen him walk on water, had seen him raise Lazarus from the dead, had seen him raise two other people from the dead, had seen him change uh, water into wine, had seen him do miracle after miracle after miracle, and yet because he would not declare himself emperor of the world, he decided to work on the impulse of his heart. Satan knew what his weakness was and was able to have this man uh, turn his back and rebel on the Lord Christ himself. I want to tell you, do not think 
above what you ought of this creature who you are. The Word says, in spite of that, Jesus, knowing that the Father has given him all things into his hands, that he had come from God and he was going back to God. Folks say, well, how much did Jesus know? He knew everything. Read your Bible. He knew everything. He was saying what was happening, what had happened, and what was happening. He knew who he was. Understand this verse, by the way. Knowing the Father had given him all things. What are all things here? All things pertaining to salvation. I mean, he, he had all things, but here is all things pertaining to salvation. He had given him all that was necessary that he might redeem those that he had been sent to redeem. He knew what was at hand. He knew what needed to be done. He had all that was necessary to do that. He rose from supper, laid aside his garments. That means this outer robe that he wore. This was that seamless garment that just a few hours from then, the Roman guards that stood around his cross would cast lots for so they would not have to rend it. It was that garment that he wore that folks looked at him and called him rabbi because it identified him as a Jewish teacher. It was that garment that had been made specially for him that set him apart as a leader is that garment that he took off and laid to the side. His disciples, no doubt, cast an eye towards him and wondered why the master would take this garment off. He took a towel, a linen towel, and girded himself. In other words, he tied that towel around him. He took a basin that was there, began pour water into it, and then he began to wash his disciples' feet and wipe them with water. You cannot imagine how silent that room became. See, the task that our Lord began to do was the task that the most menial, lowest slave servant would do. Slaves had their own level that they had. You had the slave that had worked his way up, and he had a higher position, and they had their own caste system. And the lowest of the low slave got to wash feet as folks entered the house. Evidently, no one chose to wash anybody's feet as they entered this house. And I know we have a picture drawn in our minds from Michelangelo mainly, laying on his back, painting on the Sistine Chapel of this beautiful room with a table like we have with white cloth on it and the disciples and our Lord around it. All of them look like Anglos, like us. But you can just wipe that out. There's no valid picture like that. This, this was an Oriental, Middle Eastern setting. They were sitting on very low cushions with a low table around them. Their feet were sticking out, one foot upon the next one, so each one got to see each one's dirty feet. Y'all probably couldn't even eat that way. Some of you would gag. I know a few of you. And so here they were having supper with their dirty feet and no one asking why hadn't somebody washed feet? The Lord now has taken the basin and the towel, and he's began to wash these disciples' dirty feet. Here, 
We read in Philippians chapter 2, Bill did for us, the King of glory himself, creator of the universe, thought it nothing. He was God himself to take on the form of a servant, stooped to earth, all the way to the most menial servant, the lowest of the lowest. And begin to wash the feet of his disciples. As he had washed several of their feet, I don't know how many, the Bible doesn't tell us. Finally, he comes to Peter. Good old loud mouth Peter. Peter says, and the, the English doesn't do us any good here. Because Peter looks at him and says, you feet wash mine? He was astounded. No. Jesus looked at him and said, you don't understand what I'm doing now, but later on you will understand. We know now that he meant that when the Holy Spirit comes, after I have been crucified, buried, rise again, the Holy Spirit comes, he will give you understanding of all things. You will understand. Peter, just wait just a little bit. Peter didn't have any weight in him. Like some of you, you don't have any weight in you. You want to know what the Lord wants you to do right now. You want everything right now. Lord, tell me right now. Give me something to do right now. If you don't tell me right now, I'm going to go do something and get in trouble. And then I'm going to blame you, God. Right now. But you know, the Lord sometimes says, wait. Wait. Some of your, your dispositions, your temperament is, do it, 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 do it. And I'm glad. You, you need, God, God uh, hits moving targets. Matter of fact, God never works with an unmoving target. Do something, yeah, I agree. But, but wait and find out what God wants you to do. Don't, don't jump off a cliff without a parachute. You know what happens if you jump off a cliff without a parachute? You hit the bottom pretty hard. This was Peter. He didn't listen. He didn't listen. You know why I know he didn't listen? He says, you will never wash my feet. Jesus just told him, wait, you'll figure, it'll it'll get figured out. You'll understand when the time comes. Peter didn't hear a word of that. That's what I try to tell folks. Try to talk with them, try to discuss stuff. No, preacher, I said, give it a little time. Listen, read your Bible, pray. No, I want to know now. Now it's not time. You're not ready yet. You're not mature enough yet. What, me not mature enough? Yes, you not mature enough. Grow some. No, you'll never wash my feet. Peter, if I don't wash your all over, you can have no part of me. Peter, oh, wash me all then. Peter, Peter, Peter. Blow up, man. Let's get this right. Peter didn't have to with him yet. Peter would get it. Peter's going to slow up before it's over with, folks. He's going to get it right before it's over with. It's going, to t- it's going to take a humiliation to do so. He's going to have to deny the Lord and get really humble. And then Peter's going to get it right. You don't have to do it that way, but it can happen that way. God will let it happen that way. He says, I'm th- verse 10, by the way, y'all trying to keep up with my goings on this morning. Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. He said, but not all of you are clean. He's talking about Judas, for he knew who would portray him, for he said, you are not all clean. He's, um, he's speaking to these guys, trying to get them to understand what it is needed 
for us to be successful in the work of God. So when he had washed their feet, taken back his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? Do you understand this? And unfortunately, they did not, and today still many folks do not. He said, You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. And here's the point I want to make right quick about it. The disciples, if you read your Bible, throughout addressed our Lord as teacher and Lord and master. Never will you find those that were intimate with the Lord calling him anything but teacher, Lord, and master. They never call him Jesus. They never call him by some familiar name because they knew who he was. We live in a day of familiarity where folks want to buddy up with our Lord. I want to tell you, you would do well to call him teacher, Lord, and master. The reason folks do not call him that is because he is not their teacher, nor their Lord, nor their master. He may be Jesus, but he is not their teacher, nor their Lord, nor their master. I would submit to you they would be better off were he their teacher, Lord, and master. Amen. See, today, we live in a day when I am the Lord and the Master. I will do what I want to do, preacher. You can't tell me anything. Well, you can tell me, but I'm not going to do it. See, people today believe that this is a suggestion. You can suggest all you want to, preacher. But I'm going to live my life the way I want to. It'll be all right when I get to heaven. Because I've made some commitment back yonder and said, uh, I, I, I believe I'll be all right. I want to tell you, if he's not your teacher, if he's not your Lord, if he's not your master, I wouldn't want to stand before him. Don't go to heaven and say, hey, Jesus, I got it all right. How about you, buddy? He ain't your buddy. By the way, I'll just give you a hint here. Don't call me buddy. Salesman comes up to me and says, buddy, what you want? You'll never sell me anything. I ain't your buddy. Find out what my name is and call me that. But don't call me buddy. Listen, if you listen to salesman somewhere, that's just my pet peeve. He is Lord, Master, Teacher. You call me Teacher and Lord, and you, you say, well, for so am I, he says. If then your Lord and Teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Now, so what has happened? Unfortunately, folks have reduced this to a ceremony. I was raised in a denomination that has reduced this principle to a ceremony of washing the saints' feet. And I suppose there's nothing wrong with washing the saints' feet, but if you see in this a ceremony that you are to do, you have missed the point. What you need to see here, Jesus is teaching us, and I'll read you out of Luke here in a minute, is, in here, is teaching us that as our example, he has left heaven's glory, derobed himself of his divinity, and become humble to the point of the most menial servant, willing even to wash his disciples' feet, to serve his fellow man that they might see his Father in heaven, we likewise ought to divest ourselves of our pride and do whatever is necessary that we might show our fellow man 
who our Father in heaven is. We ought to humble ourselves no matter what. Whatever it takes. My dear brother ministers need to hear this. We can be some of the most proud, self-centered, self-serving people, just like in the day that Jesus walked. And folks look at us, and they see in us what is not the reality of Christ. We ought to be humble. We ought to be servants. We are call ourselves the under-shepherd of the Lord Jesus. If so, we ought to emulate Him. We looked Wednesday night and that great crowd of folks that come on Wednesday night in the book of Ephesians, the fifth chapter, and the first verse says we are to mimic our Lord. We are to imitate Him. We are to be like Him. And here He says we are to do whatever is necessary, even if it means to stoop and wash the feet of the saints. It doesn't mean a literal washing. It means whatever. If it means to go out and to take a meal to them, if it means to put on clothes like them, if it means whatever, we are not to put ourselves above those around us. We are to, to come to them and to share the Lord Jesus Christ with them whatever way however way that we can. We are not to lord above others. We are simply saved saints, saved sinners. We are to understand except for the grace of God we too would spend eternity in hell. It's not about the ceremony here of washing feet. It is about the heart. And what is necessary or a person to be in right relationship with his fellow man. He says, Most assuredly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent them. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Blessed are you if you do them. Let me turn right quick like to uh, Luke chapter 22. Verse 24, you'll see this uh, uh, here. Jesus is going to admonish in the 24th verse of the 22nd chapter. Luke says, Now there was also a dispute among them, this is at the same time, as to which of them should be considered the greatest. And he said to them, that is Jesus talking to his disciples, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. But not so among you. On the contrary, he who, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. For he who is greater, he who sits at the table, or he who serves. It is he who sits at the table, yet I am among you as the one who serves. That's the Lord Jesus. But you are those who have continued with me as, as in my trials. And I bestow upon you a kingdom just as my father bestowed on one upon me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on the thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So he's telling them that they need to be like him. Though he came from heaven, he didn't come to rule over them. He came to serve, and they need to learn to be servants like he's been a servant. He became the example that we might see. One last thing. We need to see that this water that he's talking about, he is not talking about the washing literally of water. He says, as the psalmist does in Psalms 119, verse 9, he says, How can a young man cleanse his ways by taking heed according to your word? It is the word that cleanses somebody, not water. Ephesians uh, chapter 5, verses 24 and 25 tells us the same thing. You can write that down and read it on your own time. I won't uh, keep us here uh, reading uh, that verse for us, but it simply says uh, the same thing for us. What has changed the world is what I am talking to you about this morning. The world system says, systems says, the strong rule over the weak. 
the mighty govern the weak. And that is what has ruled the world up until the, the coming of Christianity. Christianity came along and said, wait a minute, we don't believe that. We believe, as Josh taught the little children, that every man is equal in the sight of God because every man has the stamped image of God on them and everybody has value in the sight of God. Christianity marched across the world and taught that the strong ought to look after the weak. And then uh, along came a society that is called the American Society with an American experiment and began to teach that we should look after the weak and care for the weak. And then when we conquered societies, rather than bringing them into our world, we would build them up and sit them back on their own and not keep them. We, we have been the only world empire that did not subjugate the world to our rule. We did not conquer Germany and keep it. We did not conquer Japan and keep it. We have not conquered kingdoms and kept them. As a matter of fact, we have rebuilt them and seen them come back to bite us. Why? Because we live by the very Christian principle that the Lord Jesus sets before you this morning. Unfortunately, that principle has been lost to many, including the church. The church doesn't even know or see that anymore. But that is the great principle that the Lord Jesus puts before you this morning. That we are to be servants to all, including those weaker than we. Those that cannot return anything for what we are able to do for them. Because in the end, it is God that will reward. Only Christianity has that principle. No other religion ever has had that principle. Islam does not have that principle. Buddhism does not have that principle. Hinduism does not have that principle. Atheism certainly does not have that principle. No other world religion but Christianity. None. You are called to live out that principle. And I am here challenging you this morning, dear believer. Live that out every day, every way, constantly. Humble yourself. Become the foot washers of the world. And when you do that, you will spread the message of God, the message of the Lord Jesus Christ, like a wildfire. How can that be? Because the power of God will exude then from you. In your weakness, the power of God will flare. The Apostle Paul would say, in my weakness, I am then strong. See, it's when we try by our might, to do the things of God is when we fail. But when we realize that it is in ourselves, we have no power. But in Him, all things are possible. Then we truly become some of the servants that God here has challenged us through His Son that we can become. So I'm going to ask you the question that He asked these folks here. Do you know what I have done to you? Do you know what God, through Christ, has done to you? He's changed you if you're a believer. He has changed you. You are no longer that arrogant human being that you came into this world, believing that you 
could do what you want to do. That might makes right. I'm going to get my piece of the pie. I'm going to have what I want out of this world. I'm going to make my way. No, you are no longer that person. You're now a foot washer. You're now the student. You could become a servant. See, that's not appealing to this world. That's not what I signed up for, preacher. I know about sort of means I didn't sign up for. That's the reason when the many, many folks get to heaven, they're going to hear the words. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew. And they're going to say, Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons? Didn't we do all of these things? And the Lord's going to say, I'm sorry, I never knew you. Because you were doing what you wanted to do. Is he your Lord, teacher, and master? Father, speak our hearts this morning. Help us when we're so arrogant, so proud of who we are. Look at others in this world as if we are somebody unwilling to stoop and wash the dust off the feet of those in this world that so desperately need to see humble servants loving this world caring about where people truly are, caring whether they'll spend eternity in heaven or hell, caring about folks more than caring about ourselves. Challenge our hearts this morning. We pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.